So I uh, have been interested in cancer clusters, I mean, interested in cancer epidemiology, cancer control. Uh, Dr. Ellen Funkhauser, is Ellen still working? Do we know? She went to preventive medicine. Ellen Funkhauser and I, early on in like the 80s, uh, did some cancer cluster investigations for the Alabama Department of Public Health. Uh, back then, Dr. Charles Wernley, who has since passed away, was a good friend of mine, and he was the state epidemiologist, and he had us investigate reports of cancer clusters, and that's kind of where we'll start. Um, when I went to medical school, I didn't like it very much, so I didn't become a, I got the degree, I didn't become a real doctor. Uh, one of my professors in medical school that I remember, Dr. Louis Dinon, D-I-N-O-N, um, said, this is one of those like pearls of wisdom, I thought, we can talk about anything if we first define our terms, anything from how to bake a chocolate cake, how to make a nuclear bomb, whatever you want to do, as long as you know what I'm talking about and you know what I'm talking about. So the, I, the uh, cancer cluster, again, when people say there is or is not a cancer cluster, one has to raise one's hand and say, what do you mean by a cancer cluster? So the, what I call the subject, I'm not, this is to remind me what to say, I'm not going to read it to you. Um, the subjective definition is the impression or thought by somebody whether it's a citizen or the mayor or the paramedic, that there are too many cancer cases on this block, in this neighborhood, something like that. Um, problems there, um, big thing on case definition. And Dr. Mike Metz, who used to be on our faculty, he has passed away. I guess maybe I'm close to next. Um, Dr. Metz taught cancer, or he taught cancer at times, infectious disease epi. And when Dr. Metz gave you a test and you didn't know the answer, the wise thing in the answer is somewhere mentioned the phrase case definition, because that was he was big on. So when these are non-scientific people uh, in, in the public, not educated necessarily in medicine or epidemiology, they're just citizens, uh, sometimes the reported cases are not cases. So one example, and we'll get to brain cancer later, there's primary brain cancer and their metastases to the brain spread to the brain from cancer somewhere else. So when I go over brain cancer clusters, we're talking about primary brain cancer, but I think it's much more common if you find people with cancer in the brain that it was a metastasis from somewhere else. So if those two things are mixed together, it, it doesn't make sense to mix them together. That's an example. Um, the excess thing is a big issue in epidemiology. There's the observed versus expected. So observed numbers or rates, I think you can pretty much nail down with some work, like eliminating, looking at the data. The expected uh, idea when we do uh, standardization, uh, the expected value or expected number or expected rate sometimes can come under fire from critics. Like I wouldn't have calculated my expected that way. Okay. The objective of more scientific definition, I would say statistical excess. Uh, and maybe there's definitions in between that, uh, again, someone um, in epi biostat does calculations and is very careful about who's a case, the reported cases, are they all really cases of the same thing, or are there a few extra people in there? Um, that can be more, I guess, scientific. And if you want to call that a cluster, like there's more than there were expected. We expected in this time period 10 cases, and we observed... 20 cases. Okay. Now, uh, when you do cluster investigations, easy explanations, if they apply, is an older population. So, as you know, uh, cancer is number two on causes of death in the U.S., heart diseases being number one. Uh, lots of people get cancer. Um, again, the most common cancers are breast among women. Uh, prostate among men, lung among both, actually, colorectal cancers. So when uh, Ellen and I investigated early cancer clusters before the discipline evolved at least a bit, a lot of the cluster reports where there's too many cancers here, there's three, and I, I the person in the community, I know of three people in our neighborhood who had colon cancer and two more had breast cancer and one more had lung cancer, and it was a what I would call a potpourri of cancers that may not be caused in general by the same thing. 
And some of those cancers are caused by smoking, some are not. So sometimes it's because your neighborhood, sir or madam, you have a lot of old people here to be blunt about it. And okay, environmental hazard. That's what a lot of people are concerned with. The idea that people are getting cancer seemingly more often or more, more numbers than we expect. And it's that factory down the road with the smoke coming out and maybe people suspect that. Uh, maybe a problem there is induction period. Cancer, as far as I understand, is not caused by breathing bad smoke and next week you get cancer. The induction period for cancers is often many years or decades. So the current environmental condition of the neighborhood may reflect what it used to be and still is. So it's not irrelevant, uh, but that's sometimes what people are focused on. So one of the missions, I think we'll get to that in another slide, is to be responsive in a public health practice mode to public concerns. So you don't laugh at people and say, you don't know the induction period of cancer, but explain that idea. Number three, I think sometimes comes out uh, a successful um, investigation. That is, you come up with, here's what I think, and something pretty specific, uh, occupational related. One reason there is there are often data collected previously um, if it's if it's a uh, situation where uh, there is a big industry, automobile manufacturers, whatever, they have number one data on their employees who got cancer. Uh, if that's the report. You know, what particular jobs did they do? What substances did they use? How long did they work there? Uh, what medical tests they had? And they would also, again, if you're an occupational epidemiologist, and we uh, had in our department, Dr. Elizabeth Delzell and uh, the late Dr. Nalini Sathya Kumar and some others who's, uh, whose main thing was occupational epi, because if you get access to those uh, data, you have exposure data and you have disease data by the medical records and the employment records. So that time, that, that scenario maybe is looking good. Chance. Um, the idea that uh, this is not a good explanation if there are big numbers, but small numbers. Um, observed number is more than expected, but small. The idea is, for instance, um, and back to the definition of clustering. If I say there's a rare cancer in Alabama or in Jefferson County, where we expect 12 cases per year, I would think it odd if I observed exactly one case per month, one case in January, one case in February, one case in March. This would look a little odd. I would more expect some months zero, some months one, occasionally two, very occasionally three. When you add them up, there's 12 cases in 12 months, okay? So the idea on chance is if someone focuses on the month where there were three, this looks, you know, if you, if you calculated a, an annual rate multiplied three by 12, you get 36 per year. That's kind of fu fuzzy math. Um, uh, the idea also with that is no one calls the health department and says, we are expecting five or 10 cases of this cancer this month. We didn't, we didn't find any. What's wrong? They don't say that. So you get the reports of, you know, things, things out of the ordinary on the high side. Um, why do you investigate clusters? Why do you investigate clusters? <laughs> yes, um, pizza's over that way if you want some. Scientific, um, yes, I mean, I'm a cancer epidemiologist, cancer control person, probably more so uh, applied. Uh, I'd like to know causes of cancer. Um, however, to make the point of, and I think CDC, I tried to tell them about it, but I don't know if they agreed or understood. A cancer cluster investigation usually is what I would call a case series. Line up, at least in the abstract, all the people that got this cancer, where do they live, where do they work, why did they think they got the cancer. That's not ideologic by itself because there's no comparison group. So if you have a cancer cluster and you say eight of, eight of these 10 new cases of cancer, they all, eight, eight out of 10 work at this factory, I would say, well, in the community around here, Maybe eight out of 10, everybody works at this factory. So you need a control group or a comparison group 
So an etiologic study, I think the only way you can prove or come close to proving cause and effect is to have two groups. So you could do a case control study, cases that have, but that's, that's beyond, I think, cluster investigation. Case control study, where you have the cases of the cancer control, match controls, age, race, sex. You could do nested case control, where there was some follow-up and you go back, or a retrospective follow-up study. Now that goes, I think, above and beyond a cluster investigation, but would it be? Uh, number two, I think, is very important because if you're in public health practice in a state or local health department, then I think there's what, you, what your job should include, and you owe people in the community who are upset about the impression and maybe reality, like there's too many cancer cases here, okay? So I think that's part of the investigation. Like, even if you think this, this is ridiculous, I'm never going to find a scientific explanation, you should still do something. Uh, intervention and prevention, I think, is, again, in the uh, area of cancer control. Cancer control, for the students who haven't had this, is the application of what we know about cancer causes, uh, ways to prevent it, applic apply what we know to the community to prevent further cases. And that's certainly important. Um, uh, establishing the statistical excess. So this is, and we'll talk about the Texas sharpshooters phenomenon. The idea is for the person in the community, again, an initial report often comes from someone, uh, maybe a very smart individual, but they're not, they don't have an MD or a PhD in public health or whatever, they're a community person. And they report what they report. Then again, a methodologic problem is when you wanna calculate an observed cancer rate, what are your time and space limits? Now, the reporting person kind of seems to set that for you. They would say, in this neighborhood. Okay, so take it face value. What, how do you define the neighborhood? Different streets, different boundaries. Um, the size of the population, you can count those up. And by age, uh, part B there, uh, case definition. If you want to get real about it, again, make sure that the nine people who have lung cancer or brain cancer, whatever, really have that. Um, the period at risk. So that's one of those, again, you can do uh, so-called fuzzy math. Um, the problem in this methodologically is you, the investigator, are not setting the time period or the spatial boundaries. So um, the Texas sharpshooters phenomenon, the Texas sharpshooters phenomenon says Again, if you were a nefarious person or for some reason wanted to create havoc, uh, you could change your time and space parameters and get kind of a different answer because you decided uh, maybe they're concerned about uh, the number of cases observed this year and, and maybe your scientific mind says, well, it's kind of rare. Why don't we look at three years worth of data? And maybe in the other two years, the three consecutive years, the other two years there weren't any. So it evens out. So this is, again, the idea that I think it's not etiologic research. It's, it's a concern. But the idea is observed and expected rates. I could change my expected rate uh, different ways. I could, again, increase the time span. So the blip, if, let's say if I wanted to do that intentionally, which I would not do that, unethical, I can make the blip go away expanding the time by a couple of more months or a couple more years. Okay. Um, back of the envelope calculations. Um, so that was started there. Clearly uh, to define the population, the cases, observed rate. Uh, sometimes uh, I said a mortality rate. Sometimes cancer cluster reports are too many people died from cancer as opposed to too many people got it. Of course, mortality not ideal to study in epi for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, dead dead cancer cases. First, they had to get cancer, then they had to not survive it. So if you look at mortality risk or mortality data, that brings in access to healthcare, yes or no, uh, other things other than causation. It's a little bit further away from the cause, whereas incidence, of course, is closer in time to the cause. Um, you would calculate the students will remember this is indirect standardization, uh, standardized incidence uh, rate ratio or standardized mortality rate ratio, p-value or confidence interval. Um, 
We'll get back to those later. Uh, and those statistical excess, again, a problem uh, Dr. Funkhauser and I would face is how far do we go with this? Again, being responsive to the community, and I think that's appropriate. Um, often, uh, in my experience, there are community ad advocates who basically say, thank you for investigating, but you didn't find the cause, keep investigating. I mean, so like, what do you do next? Uh, if you say, well, there's not really a statistical excess because it's an older population or you have some other um, explanation, I don't really think the statistical access is in the heart of what we should focus on. Uh, it could be, and again, that's a precision issue versus a validity issue. Um, if the statistical access is present, we are right now in the Herman F. Lehman, Lehman Jr. Uh, classroom, are we not? Yes. Well, Dr. Lehman, I have his original notes from, I came to this School of Public Health in 1981, I was 11 years old at the time. Uh, I came to study primarily with Dr. Phil Cole, but I also studied with Dr. Lehman, who is our associate dean. His photo kind of etched there is in the back. You can read it later. Um, he was kind of an old school, back of the envelope type of epidemiologist. So he talked about armchair epidemiology and shoe leather epidemiology. So armchair epidemiology back then, before people had personal computers, I guess we still had calculators, go back to your office and by armchair, again, is the number one, two, three, four, tabulate the number, search for additional cases, recalculate. Uh, then if things look, hmm, I think there is something here to investigate, then you transition to shoe leather, meaning you're in the field and you're wearing out your shoes because you're walk, walking so far to interview people. Case definition, number one, the concern concern, concern was you know, I don't know, 10 cases, maybe two of them have something else. So usually it doesn't make sense to try to find a common cause of 10 cases, except two of them have a different disease than the other eight. So, okay. Um, interview relatives. I think it's very important in investigations to ask the people what they think. Um, so if someone reports, again, a layperson, community advocate, even if they report something that you think scientifically, no way. Like people are drinking too many milkshakes and they're getting this cancer. You can't dismiss that. I mean, you have to listen to what they have to say and look into it, okay? Uh, environmental measurements, if we have folks in our environmental health sciences department, and if you know what to measure. See, we can't measure the environment. You gotta be real specific. What do we wanna measure? Um, Number five, the report, and sometimes it's accepted, but again, the, the situations I was involved in, if we didn't find a really particular cause and then know what to do about it, they were not happy, not satisfied. And I understand that. Sometimes we just didn't have a conclusion. Um, the ideologic studies I mentioned, setting time and space. Okay, one of my mentors, at least indirectly, Ken Rothman, who was at Harvard along with Dr. Cole, um, was known back in the 90s as a cluster buster. He's an epi methods person. I use one of his books in my epi 610 um, principles of epi epidemiologic research course. And back then he basically said, uh, I don't want to misquote him, like most of these cluster reports, investigations, like don't bother. Now this was the attitude actually that some health departments had because they maybe still do. Like, come on, we have HIV AIDS out there. We got the flu. We got lots of stuff to do. We don't have enough staff. You want me to dedicate a staff member or two to trace down cancer cluster reports. So some like to do that and some did not. Ken Rothman, I, don't, I haven't talked with him. He's still alive. Talked with him recently. I don't know if he's changed his tune. That's a long time ago. Um, okay, so where I got involved in this fairly recently was, um, I got on, I don't remember how I got on the list uh, from CDC and ATSDR, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. I got on their email list for, I don't know, people interested in cancer clusters. And uh, they sent, I'm not going to click on this, but you can click on it later. The, there is a 2013, copyright 2013 um, instructions for you health departments or anyone else out there how to do a cancer cluster investigation. 
Um, they at CDC over time got, I think, some pushback from different health departments for different reasons. A lot of health departments around the country, I remember working with Dr. Burnley in, in Alabama. Other states were doing a lot more than Alabama. Other states weren't doing anything. Like, we don't have time for this. So there was a non-standard approach across the 50 states and, and U.S. territories. Um, so a CDC and ATSDR decided to update uh, the guidelines. There was a steering committee. I was one of the partners where they would send us drafts of here's how we would revise the old guidelines in this particular uh, topic. And then we give them feedback. So you can click on that later if you are so interested. They created the 2022 guidelines. Um, they wrestled with different people mean different things slightly by cancer cluster. It means at least three cancer cases does it, and when you use the word, does it imply you know or think it was caused by the same thing? That's where there is like cognitive dissonance about that. Um, so here are the things that the 2022 guidelines, which are now available, and you can read about them uh, on that uh, link. And they did a better job of, uh, I don't know if they can order state health departments what to do, but here is what we suggest y'all do uh, at minimum in investigating a, a cluster. Um, and now, of course, we have uh, GIS and some other uh, technical abilities we didn't have before. But again, that's helpful. But again, with the Texas sharpshooters phenomenon and other methodologic issues, again, I think when time and space is already set for you, the investigator, and you're left with just tell me in this time and space that uh, I in the community told you about, that that's a problem. And I don't know that that can be overcome. So these are three cluster invest clusters under investigation that I think are quite interesting. Um, okay, I don't know if you can, yeah, you can read that pretty well. So these are among former Philadelphia Phillies, and I remember all of these Phillies because I, I was a Phillies fan since about 10 years old. So uh, I won't read it all to you, but there's certain things that points I want to make. So name in the left-hand column, Ken Brett was a starting pitcher. He didn't play, he was only there about a year for the Phillies. Uh, Darren Dalton, uh, a very much a favorite catcher. Um, Tug McGraw, does anybody know Tug McGraw? Dr. Weissman does. Frank Edwin, known as Tug McGraw, and I wanted to make sure, I hope I wouldn't embarrass people. Why was Frank Edwin McGraw commonly called, when you play baseball, Tug McGraw. Anyone? Any guesses? Did he tug on his hat a lot? No. And this was said on TV. Back when he was born and nursing, he was a very aggressive feeder. And he used to tug on his mother's nipples. And as a baby, they referred to him as Tug. And that uh, name never left. So he was, again, nine years uh, on the Phillies under notes. Um, Tim McGraw Singer is son of Tug. Uh, Tug McGraw played for the Mets and then the Phillies. His out pitch was a screwball. Now he was a screwball kind of by personality. A screwball is like a curveball, but it breaks in the opposite direction. So the Tugger was a left-handed pitcher very effective. He was a closer, meaning he usually pitched the ninth inning when the team was ahead, because a batter could tell it wasn't a fastball coming because it's not fast enough, but it wouldn't know is a curveball, is it a curveball going to break that way or a screwball going to break the other way? So, and, and his motto was, you got to believe. He was on pennant winning teams for both Mets and the Phillies. Whoops. Johnny Oates was a catcher. John Vukovich, utility infielder. David West, the starter. Um, they all got, sorry, cause COD is cause of death, column before the end, brain cancer. Now, is brain cancer common? No. Incidence rate, and this is, again, primary brain cancer arising in the brain, not a metastasis from somewhere else. You can read the incidence rate, uh, number eight among 40-year-olds and more. Um, is more common about childhood cancer. Childhood cancer is a different roster of what cancers will kids get? 
Um, causes unknown. Uh, gliomas and meningiomas, uh, definitions there. If you have a glioma, this is not good. Five-year survival, 7%. Uh, meningiomas, again, uh, this is what I somewhat remember from medical school. Um, crushed brain tissue. So that's hard. And if you have even a malignant or malignant or benign tumor that's growing, it's crushing. Okay. Um, and the bottom there, we leave out um, secondaries. Why did the Phillies, former Phillies, two theories, um, and maybe there's more, and maybe neither one's correct. The Phillies uh, used to play in Veterans Stadium, 1971, 2003. That was the era where a lot of cities built one stadium, usually round, that could do baseball, football, or anything else. And a lot of them had artificial turf, so they could take up the baseball diamond and put down the football field. Um, these were thought to be state-of-the-art. There was one in St. Louis, one in Cincinnati. Most of them, I think, are gone because people didn't like them. Maybe there was dangers. Um, so one of the concerns was, and you can talk to Phillies still alive, I remember, and not me, that back on playing in Veteran Stadium on the AstroTurf, especially when the sun was, we could smell a lot of stuff. Chemicals, so if you're smelling chemicals, you're getting some exposure. Philadelphia Eagles football team also played there, but again, their exposure, they, they haven't reported these cases. So anyway, that's one, take it or leave it. Another was radar gun. Um, so I don't know how they do pitch velocity now, but again, they like to say, if, if you're not a baseball person, you may not know. How fast is that guy throwing a fastball? So like 100 miles an hour, some current pitchers can hit 100 miles an hour. And they used to do it by a radar gun where I was in a strategic position and I could, okay. The idea there was because of the play, the Phillies, five out of six were pitchers or catchers. Not John Vukovic was an infielder. The others were pitchers or catchers. So let's see if this will play. Here is from a... Fox News in Philadelphia interview. Here we go. Last week, former Phillies pitcher David West passed away at the age of 57, joining five other players to die of brain cancer since 2003 who played for that team in that same stadium. The strange spring of deaths leading baseball fans to revisit theories that Veteran Stadium could be to blame. All of them played in Vet Stadium before it was demolished back in 2004. There it is. Former Phillies pitcher Larry Anderson and Fox News medical contributor Dr. Mark Siegel join us now. Larry, I know it's tremendously tragic. I mean, we knew these play, uh, we knew these players as players. You knew them as friends. How do you feel about this? Um, it's devastating. Uh, starting in '03 um, with uh, uh, Ken Brett, and then followed by Tug McGraw the following year, and then it's just. Uh, it's it's devastating. That's really it's the only word for it. I mean, you have there, there were pitchers and catchers, Doctor Siegel, uh, and they were all great players. They all played there. Do you look at this as something that should be examined or a coincidence? First of all, it's a cluster and it needs to be examined. The amount of incidents of deadly brain cancer, about three out of 100,000. This is three to four times that if, or more. Uh, by the way, Larry Anderson, it's an honor to be on with him. He was a great pitcher. You know, Brian, in his late 30s, he was all, that was, those were his best years. And Tug McGraw, you got to believe, from the Miracle Mets. Now, let me look at the medicine, medicine of this for a second. Uh, uh, right. Tug McGraw, uh, unbelievable pitcher, inspired New Yorkers here uh, and Philly. But one, one thing about the medicine of this, they've said, they're saying veteran state because of the AstroTurf or because it was built on a marsh. But I want to add, because of David West, that five out of these six players are pitchers or catchers. And the military, Brian, has done research on microwaves that are given at a very high frequency and a lot of exposure. And the radar gun, you get hundreds of, of, of incidences of the radar gun being used during a game. I am not saying that that's what it is, but in addition to the AstroTurf, because the old AstroTurf right. had a lot of chemicals, they've got to look more at that radar gun yeah, as a Ken possibility. Yeah, Ken Brett, uh, Tug McGraw, Johnny Oates, John Vukovic. Uh, and Darren Dolan, all with brain cancer. Larry, when you guys talk to each other, 
I remember at the Meadowlands that something similar happened, uh, and they said, well, you know, this was built on swampland, and they stopped using any type of water fountain. They started bringing their water and other stuff in. What do you guys talk about as you get hit with this? Uh, right now, Brian, because there, there's no way to, to figure anything out because the Veterans Stadium is now a parking lot, uh, it, it's hard to, to figure anything else out. That You know, you, you think, I think about the ground crew that was there all the time. They're on the field more than anybody, on the dirt and the grass, on the turf. Um, and they had no incidences of it. And that's why it's so, it's so confusing to everybody. And it just, you just kind of sit back. You know, guys that have coached there, played at the vet when it first opened. Larry Boa, for example, like, he, he played with a lot of these guys and, or, or coached with them. And, and for him, I, I got to believe it's like, is he next? Is right. he going to be next? Or is somebody going to be next? You don't know. And, uh, it, and it's, it's just so hard that they, there's no way to put anything together. Well, are you, you had two stints there. Are you getting yourself checked out? Um, there, uh, people have questioned that uh, a, a lot with me um, for other reasons, but no, I, I, there's nothing, I mean, I don't know what to do. I, I guess, I mean, without any feeling for headaches or anything like that, there, yeah. you, you just kind of just wait and that, that there's nothing really more you can do and just, you know, pray that, uh, that, that it's the end of it. Absolutely. Uh, Brian? Uh, could go real quick. Final thought, Dr. Siegel? Brian, the, 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 the incidence of, uh, is low enough so that he, he probably doesn't have to worry. His regular doctor can check him. Uh, one other thing to add to Larry's point, the Philadelphia Eagles have not had a problem with this. So that, that goes right. against it as well, that it may not be Veterans Stadium, but though it's a possibility, it has to be investigated. It'll be interesting to see what baseball and football did differently uh, if there was. Larry Boa said, I uh, was there for 30 years. He says, I know there are a lot of pipes that were exposed when we played there, and we had right. that AstroTurf, not the field turf that we have right now. So, Larry and Dr. Siegel, thanks exactly. so much, guys. Larry, great to see you. The reason I call that AstroTurf, that was uh, the first generation artificial playing surface, and it was used in the Houston Astrodome first. And then it got marketed again to these other. Okay, let's go on. That's where Phillies now play Citizens Bank Park, baseball only, grass. Okay, a bigger cluster than the six, 127. Again, brain cancer cases among teachers, staff, and graduates of Colonia High School in New Jersey. Um, okay, so when I read up on this, that's a big cluster. Um, PCBs, highly carcinogenic, production ban, but still used in different places. Um, and you can see, according to uh, IARC, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, can cause cancer. PCBs may be, that's suspected, I, I didn't do the investigation, suspected. Causal theory number two, interesting. So I looked into Colonia, that's just the name, I don't know if that's somebody's last name or whatever. It's called Colonia High School in New Jersey, and so the story goes, uh, paragraph two, when they decided to build a new high school then in 1967, uh, they had the, the area, but they needed more soil. So they went down the road or miles away and brought in a whole bunch of soil, uh, unbeknownst to them, uh, perhaps remnants of Manhattan Project experiments, where the Manhattan Project uh, was, again, uh, World War II, the idea of developing uh, nuclear weapons, radiation in the soil on which the high school was built. Now, I don't know if that's true. And again, I haven't investigated either of these, uh, but at least there's, I mean, when you have 127, I'm not going to say we have small numbers. I would say, yeah. Okay. Almost in our own backyard. We're almost done. And then we can take questions in a few minutes. Uh, I think people are generally uh, familiar with uh, melanoma, malignant melanoma, the type of skin cancer that can kill you, as opposed to a basal cell, squamous cell, which are, are unusual uh, to be fatal. So melanoma of the skin, 22 cases per 100,000, mortality 3 per 100,000. However, one can also get, this would be an em embryology thing that Dr. Roseman could explain to us, but We'll leave it for later. If you can get melanoma on your skin, you can get melanoma in your eye, physiologically speaking. 
um, can occur in the iris, the choroid layer, ciliary body, six cases per million people, okay? Mortality rate, this is nationally, US. Two deaths per million, risk factors, if you want, you really want to call it markers, light colored eyes, okay, old age, okay, Caucasian, kind of light, so those are all kind of colored things. Dysplastic nevi syndrome may be related, environmental causes unclear, signs or symptoms on early on, later flashes of light vision loss. So this is something you don't want. Um, radiation can recur, may have to have a nucleation, test these to liver. Okay, why do I mention this in our own backyard? 36 ocular melanoma cases among Auburn University graduates. I've been to Auburn several times, some of what I've done on the CARES training grant in the past and some other things I've done, some teaching. Uh, Auburn, I love the campus. I think it's a really nice place to work. But as a marker for if someone comes in the door and says, I have ocular melanoma, you would say, did you work or live at Auburn? Okay. Um, now, there's also 18 more cases in Huntersville, North Carolina, which I never heard of. Do you know Huntersville, North Carolina? Okay, there's a map in the video we're gonna show in a minute. It's not real close to Auburn. There's 18 more cases there. So this is double mystifying, okay? Connection between these two locations, I don't know. And even the connection to, again, they graduated from Auburn I don't think the graduation ceremony gave them ocular melanoma, but probably a marker that they lived close by at the at the wrong time, the wrong number of years. This is from CBS News. Researchers want to know what may be causing a rare eye cancer in two states. First, a group of 18 patients was identified in Huntersville, North Carolina. Well, now there's a second group in Auburn, Alabama, home of Auburn University. Ocular melanoma is usually found in just six of every one million people. Anna Werner spoke with victims who share other connections. Anna, good morning. Good morning, Nora. And this eye cancer is so rare. Doctors say having a group of four younger women is unusual. But what is even more striking is that all four of them attended Auburn University in the same time frame, and three of them were and are friends. Friends often have something in common, but in this group, it's something no one would envy. They all developed a rare eye cancer called ocular melanoma. Julie Green was first. At age 27, she saw odd flashes of light. He said, there is a mass there. There's something there. I don't know what it is. It looks like it could be, you know, a tumor. I mean, it's like you had just had the breath knocked out of you, you know? And I just In 2001, it was her college friend, Allison Allred, 31 at the time. I was just seeing some mild flashes of light for, say, seven to 10 days. A doctor told her she had a detached retina, but then... He said, well, it's detached because there's a 10 millimeter melanoma sitting on it. A large tumor. Both women had to have an eye removed. Then their friend Ashley McCrary found black spots in her iris. It was the same rare cancer. What's crazy is literally standing there, I was like, well, I know two people who've had this cancer, you know, Julie and Allison. And did you understand then how strange that was? No, no, I didn't. Strange enough that she mentioned it to Dr. Marlena Orloff, the oncologist treating her at Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. Most people don't know anyone with this disease. Just six in every one million people are diagnosed with ocular melanoma each year. But groups of people in two cities have now developed the cancer, Huntersville, North Carolina, and now Auburn. We said, okay, these girls were in this location. Um, they were all definitively diagnosed with this very rare cancer what's going on. Dr. Orloff and her colleagues are now studying these patients, many of whom travel to Philadelphia for treatment. Another Auburn grad, Lori Lee, kept her eye, but the cancer metastasized to her liver. She now travels from Alabama to Philadelphia every six weeks to be treated in a clinical trial. This is a rare cancer, so it's not like you can just go anywhere and have anybody know anything really about it. There is no known cure. Allison Allred's cancer has recurred nine times in six places in her body. Um, two days ago, found out that it's come back to my brain. So I'm actually going to have radiation on my brain tomorrow. 
How do you sit there with a smile given everything that you've been through? Mm -hmm. It's totally the Lord. It's totally the Lord that has carried us through every step of it. And the other thing that's you know kind of touchy mm -hmm. is that people think of what happened to the three of you as a disfiguring injury. That was very hard for me. You know, growing up, the one thing that I liked about myself was my eyes. But their own struggles motivated them to help find other cancer victims. Ashley McCrary started a Facebook page. So far, she says 36 people have responded, saying they too attended Auburn University and have been diagnosed with ocular melanoma. We believe that when we're looking at what's going on in Huntersville, North Carolina, and what's going on here, there is something that potentially links us together. Until we get more research into this, then we're not gonna we're not gonna get anywhere. We've got to have it so that we can start linking all of them together to try to find a cause and then one day hopefully hopefully a cure. Now, Auburn University officials say they are hopeful that research and awareness will advance the prevention and treatment of this cancer. The Alabama Department of Health believes that it would be premature to determine that a cancer cluster exists. That's a very specific term, a cluster. And people want to say there's a cluster. It doesn't mean there's an actual cluster linked to one thing. Yeah, but those are this an amazing coincidence. Amazing coincidences. And right now, everybody wants to know, well, what's causing it? Yeah. Right. The best yeah. that physicians could tell us from being in Philadelphia was that they think that there may be an environmental cause, mm -hmm. um, but so far we're not learning what that might and be. And is there a larger state or federal agency that's looking into it about this connection? Well, so far we know that the state, it's sort of been state by state. North Carolina looked into it, didn't find anything definitive in Huntersville mm -hmm. out of their study. Um, so now Alabama and Auburn University has set up a task force yeah. led by a physician there because they are trying to help yeah. Um, because again, we don't. There's nothing don't known know. that it links right. to Auburn. It's just that they went to Auburn. Yeah. Environmental is worrying if you're in that environment. Yeah, right. Exactly. That is high stakes and important detective work. Thank you, Anna. Okay, so here's where we are. Um, these are from several sources uh, to reveal a cause, as opposed to again be responsive and and try. Um, when would you be successfully saying, now we know what caused it, it's X, Y, Z. Uh, these are maybe some things to consider if you, if your data kind of adheres to many or most of these 10 things. Space and time boundaries are objective, reasonable hypothesis. So again, as you all know in research, you can't just say, let's, you know, let's study what caused this. You have to have really specific thing to check out. Um, do you have a specific thing to check out? For instance, in Huntersville, North Carolina, what's that got to do with Auburn? Um, prolonged high intensity exposure. Anyway, you can read the rest. The idea is that there are a lot of methodologic uh, issues and a lot of reasons why you might not successfully come up with a really firm conclusion like that you would take to the bank. Um, there's got to be something, though, when there's this many cases. Again, the six Philadelphia Phillies, back to that. Um, I don't remember what team, but one of one of the six Phillies who died also played for another team. It might have been the Milwaukee Brewers, but it was mentioned, by the way, there was a cluster among Milwaukee Brewers. So if we have more data, you know, what do those two stadiums or stadia have in common?